it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Dance for Your Killer by J. Rubus Part 1 For Natalie Harper, the day started with a call from her agent. Um, talking to some people at an ad agency, he told her in rushed tones. Nothing's final, but if all goes well, your face will be on every bus and billboard in the city. It was a rainy autumn day in New York. The cabs passing in the street kicked up sheets of dirty water, and carpets of red and orange leaves were plastered wetly to the sidewalks, making walking precarious. Grey dishwater light filtered through the window overlooking East 58th, and even with the heater on, the damp chill of the day seeped in between the cracks. Natalie, a tall slim woman of 25 with blonde hair, a pert nose and high cheekbones, sat cross-legged in the middle of her bed. The white spread rumpled around her like freshly fallen snow. She was clad in a pair of grey lounge pants with little hearts printed across the fabric and a white tank top one size too big. As a struggling actress slash model in one of the most expensive cities in America, she lived cheaply and bought her clothes second hand. Natalie hated being poor, but it was only temporary. Her career was going to take off any day now she'd no longer have to wear ill-fitting clothes and eat glorified dog food from a can. Soon, all of the fancy restaurants and high-end shops she passed on the Upper West Side would no longer be part of the scenery. They'd be places she actually went to, frequented, enjoyed. As she listened to David Klein, her chest swelled with excitement, and she unconsciously sat forward until she was on her knees. Yeah, when will we know for sure? She asked impatiently. A week. David said. It really... He trailed off, and Natalie knew him well enough to know that there was a catch. What? She asked soberly. David sighed. Well, they want to see how you do in the play, and if you do good, they'll pick you up. He didn't have to say anything else. Natalie supplied the rest herself. If you don't do good, forget about it. And she sighed. She should have known there was a catch, wasn't there always? She'd been in New York City for three years and had been waiting every single minute for a big break. She didn't want to wait any longer. She wanted to be rich and famous now. Now, now, now. Her eyes flicked to the tiny kitchen beyond the bedroom door. If she didn't get her fame and wealth by the end of the day, she'd have to eat ramen. Again. Oh, just do your best. David said. Oh, listen, I gotta go. I'll call you when I hear something more. Natalie sighed. Yeah, all right. Ciao for now, he said. Bye. She ended the call and instantly made another one. Her sister Naomi answered on the third ring. You know, it's like 5 a.m. here, right? Ignoring her, Natalie said, You're never gonna believe this. The line was quiet for a moment. What? Naomi asked breathlessly. She sounded tense with anticipation. It's about to happen. Naomi didn't have to ask what she meant by it. It only meant one thing. Her big break. Really? Naomi asked, wonder in her voice. <laughs> Tell me all about it. Natalie and Naomi were twins. Two halves, you might say, of the same whole. They look so much alike you might have trouble telling them apart. Their personalities, however, were night and day. Natalie had always been attracted to makeup and the color pink. Naomi was a tomboy, rough and tumble. Natalie was sometimes uptight and prissy. Naomi was laid back and earthy, at home in the woods or buried up to her elbows in the engine block of the Ford. Unlike Natalie, Naomi had never had a boyfriend, and Natalie sometimes wondered if her sister preferred women. Like most adult sisters, they were fiercely close, Closer than that, even. Years ago, beyond the rim of memory, or their memory at least, their parents were killed in an auto accident. Together, they were shuffled from one home to another. Sometimes they were with relatives, other times they were with strangers. For years, they had no constant but each other. Well, Natalie remembered her and Naomi hugging tightly beneath the covers in the cold of a dark winter night, 
each seeking to assuage the fear and loneliness they felt. They moved around so much they could never make friends and set down roots. They played and hung out only with each other, going around like two best friends who couldn't get enough of each other. In the beginning, it was an act of necessity, but their shared experience had bonded them, and now they were as close as two sisters could be. Natalie almost didn't come to New York, because she couldn't bear the thought of being away from her sister, but Naomi all but made her leave. She knew how important Natalie's dream was, and she didn't want her to give it up. Naomi had always supported her, always believed in her, even when Natalie didn't believe in herself. These days, Naomi lived in California. They hadn't seen each other in almost six months, and Natalie was starting to get antsy. They needed a reunion, and soon. Well, Natalie said, it... She trailed off, some of the delirious happiness draining from her as she remembered her agent's words. Naomi picked up on it immediately, because, well, of course she did. She could read Natalie like an open book. What? she asked. Heaving a sigh, Natalie said, Depends on how well I do in this play. If I do really well, I'll get it, and if not... She trailed off again. That's all? Naomi laughed. You're great. You got this in the bag. Again, Natalie sighed. Oh, I don't know. There's a lot of talent in that play. It's like some of the girls are so much better than me. Naomi was the only person to whom Natalie would reveal even the faintest whiff of insecurity. Growing up the way she had, Natalie had learned early on that if you show a weakness, the world will eat you alive. She didn't have to worry about that with Naomi, though. Naomi was her other half. She could tell Naomi anything. Look, Naomi said soberly, you're great. You're going to get this gig. You just need to relax. If you get too worked up about it, you're going to make a mistake. Don't do that. Just go out there and work your hardest. I believe in you. Natalie almost laughed at her sister's cliched show of encouragement. <laughs> Thanks, she said. Speaking of which, I have to jump off here and get ready. All right, Naomi said. Break a leg. I will. I love you, Naomi said. She spoke with fierceness and conviction. Natalie smiled. I love you too. She hung up and threw her head back. As much as her sister's words had warmed her, she still worried that she wasn't good enough. That was something she'd just have to live with. The show, as they say, must go on. Getting up, Natalie got ready for her date with destiny. Light, peppy pop music played from a radio on a folding table and hot lights burned overhead, making Natalie sweat. It was late afternoon, and she and a half dozen other girls dressed in leotards, headbands, and leg warmers were on stage practicing their dance routine for the play, an off-Broadway affair that had done fairly well on the West Coast. Rows of empty seats swept back from the stage, and the instructor, Ms. Mellows, walked back and forth like an animal trapped in a zoo, barking orders and waving her arms. Hiya, Lindsay, she shouted. Kick higher! Lindsay tried to lift her leg higher and wound up falling down. Natalie smirked at her and kicked higher than Lindsay could ever dream. Lindsay was a USDA certified prime bitch who thought her shit didn't stink. At 18, she was the youngest cast member, tall and slim with fiery red hair and big hazel eyes that always seemed to be plotting. She came from one of the city's richest families and believed she was better than everyone else because of it. Natalie tried to like the teenager, but she was such a snooty see you next Tuesday that she couldn't do it. Flushed with embarrassment, Lindsay glared. No! Ms. Mellows screamed. No, no, no. Everyone stopped, already knowing what was coming. Ms. Mellows stormed on stage and switched the radio off. Her nostrils flared and her shoulders rose and fell, lending her the appearance of a raging bull. You have less than a week to nail this routine. At this rate, we're never going to be ready in time. I know you're a bunch of kids, but you need to get your heads out of your butts and get in gear, okay? Right, let's take it from the top. She went over to the radio, turned it on, and watched from the sidelines, her arms crossed. The girls went through the steps and motions with swan-like grace. Natalie watched Lindsay from the corner of her eye, willing her to trip over her two dumb feet. But she danced divinely, a 
Natalie hated her for it. In fact, she kind of hated all the girls who danced better than her, and there were many. Everyone has their own special talent, and everyone has an Achilles heel. Natalie's was dancing. She could walk and twirl like a cloud, but when she danced, she somehow managed to be mediocre at best. Other girls were more limber, more talented. She was middling, and when the entire cast was on stage, the audience's eyes were drawn away from her. She was a face in the crowd, and that made her mad. You wouldn't be wrong if you called Natalie Harper attention star. She craved the spotlight, and losing it for even a moment sent her into panicked hysterics. She'd do almost anything to be the one everyone looked at and admired, and she hated when someone took that away from her. Lindsay was the one who drew everyone's eyes the most, and Natalie couldn't stand it. Lindsay was the best all-around dancer, and she knew it. She would swish around the dressing room, making snide remarks about everyone else's form, and it would push Natalie to the edge. Natalie simply detested Lindsay, and hope for bad, bad things to happen to her, like twisting an ankle and having to drop out of the pageant. Ah, that would be marvellous. With her out of the picture, Natalie would have one fewer dancers standing in her way. All right, all right, Ms. Mello said and waved her hand. That's enough for now. She cut the radio off again and all of the girls came to a halt. I'll pick this up again tomorrow. You did good. Not great, but good. Coming from Ms. Mellows, that was a heck of a compliment. The girls broke and went behind the curtain. A white space backed against the stage and led to a row of dressing rooms, a communal locker room with showers and offices. Here the lighting was dim and shadows held sway. Natalie went to her dressing room, grabbed her gym bag and went into the locker room. Naked girls strutted between their lockers and the showers and steam filled the air. Her friend Melody, a pretty Asian girl with black hair and almond eyes, was rooting around in her locker, and Natalie sat on the bench behind her. Oh, my feet are killing me, Melody said. I don't think I could have danced another step. Oh, what's the point? Natalie asked darkly as she peeled off her shoes. Lindsay's going to make all of us look like chumps anyway. Melody rolled her eyes. She's not that good. Where is she anyway? Probably in her dressing room. Natalie said. She's too good to hang out with the rest of us. Slamming her locker, Melody stripped out of her leotard, revealing her firm young body. You need to stop being so negative, she said. You're a great dancer. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, compared to Lindsay, she was trash. She was trash compared to half the girls here, and every time she danced with them, it was clear to her that she was a loser. All her dreams of stardom would be dashed because she wasn't good enough. She didn't deserve the ag gig. Didn't deserve to be in this crummy play. And suddenly, she was very depressed. Eh, I guess, she said, because she didn't feel like talking about it. She just wanted to get dressed and go home to salt. You are, Melody said. Nelly peeled off her leotard and dressed in a pair of grey sweats and a black t-shirt. She wore them because they were roomy and comfortable, and saw from practice she needed roomy and comfortable. Gonna shower? Melody asked. No, Natalie said. I'm gonna head out. All right, Melody replied. Don't let Lindsay bother you. Natalie smiled. I won't. They hugged, and Natalie left. In her dressing room, the door closed. Lindsay Ferguson stood under the faucet of her private shower, the water wetting her red hair and sluicing down her body like the touch of a timid lover. She spun around, letting the spray caress her back, then ducked her head underneath. She was sore and tired, but she felt good despite falling over earlier. She could tumble and stumble all over the place and still be better than the other girls. <sighs> How they resented her. She could tell from the looks of jealousy in their eyes, and in the way they delighted in her rare missteps. They wouldn't be so happy to see her fail if they weren't worried about losing to her. Too bad they'd do exactly that. In the dressing room proper, the doorknob rattled and turned. The door opened a crack, the rusted hinges creaking like the mournful wail of a damned soul. A hand clad in a black leather glove slipped through, flexing like a spider stalking a hapless insect. 
His fingers curled around the door and pushed it open just wide enough to steal in. Black shoes clicked on the floor as the figure deliberately made its way toward the shower. Its reflection flickered across the mirror, a quick flash of black fedora and a black trench coat. The brim of its hat cast its face in darkness, hiding its features save for its wide, frenzied eyes. He reached into the folds of its coat and pulled something out. It was a knife. Its handle was black, its blade so silver that it seemed to glow like quicksilver in the half-light falling from the bulbs trimming the mirror. The shower cut out, and the shape hesitated, and then stepped into the shadows. Throwing the curtain open, Lindsay stepped out of the shower and brushed her long, silky legs, her shoulder blades flexing. She grabbed a silky robe, shrugged into it, and went to the vanity, trying her hair on the way. She pulled out the chair and sat down. Behind her, the figure lurked. Sighing, Lindsay wrapped the towel around her head, picked up a tube of lipstick and twisted the bottom. She looked at her reflection, and that's when she noticed the intruder. A shocked gasp escaped from her throat and her eyes widened. Like a spring-loaded surprise, the figure snapped forward, grabbing the towel and yanking Lindsay's head back. The knife flashed up, gleaming like a twinkling eye, and then came down, plunging deep into Lindsay's chest. Lindsay tried to scream, but it came out as a wet gurgle instead. The attacker pulled the knife out and dragged it across Lindsay's exposed throat. Coughing and gagging, Lindsay pressed her hands to the wound and fell out of her chair, landing on her stomach. The attacker walked calmly over and stood there, all boots and black pants. Her vision began to dim, she knew in that moment she was going to die. In the backstage area, Natalie made her way toward the exit door leading to the parking lot. She nodded and said goodbye to a few of the stagehands and told Ms. Mellows it was a pleasure, even though today had been anything but. At the door she paused, checked her bag and realized she'd left her cell phone charging by the front office. She sighed and went back for it. In just the time it took her to come this far, the hallway had largely emptied out. Save for the hiss of the showers and the sporadic voices of the other girls in the locker room, the building was silent and dark. Natalie spotted her cell phone and went for it, stopping in front of the closed door to Lindsay Ferguson's dressing room, when a strange whimper sounded from within. Natalie's brow crinkled and she pressed her ear to the door. Another whimper. Well, she imagined Lindsay crying over her fall, and an evil smile crept across her face. Oh, yes, she had to see this. Grabbing hold of the knob, she twisted and pushed the door open. Knock, knock, she said in a wicked sing-song voice. Are you decent? She poked her head in and looked around. The first thing she noticed was the red streaks and drops splattered across the mirror. Bottles of perfume and cold cream were strewn haphazardly across the table, as if knocked over in a struggle. The next thing was the body lying on the floor. Face white, eyes wide and staring. Lindsay Ferguson lay on her back, a gaping wound across her throat. The air left Natalie's lungs in a rush, and her skull swelled with pressure. A scream rose in her throat, and all at once she was so light-headed that she could barely stand. Right before she lost consciousness and flopped to the floor with a thud, Natalie saw one more thing. Her own white and shocked face in the blood-speckled mirror. After that, she knew no more. Part 2 The day after Lindsay Ferguson was murdered, Natalie Harper checked out of the hospital where she'd been admitted for observation the night before. She felt fine, just a little shaken, but they insisted on keeping her. That morning before the nurse brought her discharge paperwork, a detective from the NYPD came to talk to her. A tall, olive-complexioned man with dark hair and deep-set eyes, his name was Inspector Argento. His partner, an older man with greying hair and jowls, was Inspector Fragasso. Natalie was sitting up in bed when they came. Inspector Argento sat in a chair by her bedside and held a notepad in his hand. 
Um, tell me exactly what happened. She honestly tried, but the whole thing was hazy in her mind. She remembered going into the dressing room, seeing Lindsay on the floor, and then passing out. Well, that's all I can remember, she said. Are you certain? Inspector Argento asked. Natalie gave a jerky nod. I'm absolutely certain. No sooner had those words left her mouth than a memory stirred in the back of her mind. She knitted her brow in contemplation and tried to bring it into the light, but it remained hidden, decked in shadows. What is it? Inspector Argento asked, animation creeping into his voice. I, uh, I'm not sure, Natalie said at length. I think, um... She trailed off. The memory receded into the mist and was gone. What? The inspector asked again. Natalie clenched and tried as hard as she could to remember what had happened. The only thing that came was an image of her face in the vanity mirror, droplets of blood splattered across it. She told him this and asked, hey, Was there any blood on my face when they found me? No, he said. There was some on the mirror. You must have seen your reflection. Now her head was spinning and she felt like she was going to pass out again. Thankfully, a nurse happened to come in at that very moment. She sheared the cops away so that she could rest, but not before Inspector Argento gave her his card. The, um, call me if you can remember anything, he said. Anything. Natalie nodded. Hmm, the way he looked at her. Do you think that she did it? Well, she hated Lindsay, but not enough to hurt her. And she could see dark suspicion in his eyes. She tried to remember what she'd seen, what exactly she'd seen, but the memory was hazy, her mind trying perhaps to block it all out. She had a deep sense of dread in the pit of her stomach, as though she were forgetting something important. At home, she lay on her bed with her arms stretched out on either side of her, and a dazed expression on her face. The first thing she'd done upon getting home was call Naomi. Naomi listened in shock to Natalie's story, her silence deep and intense. I have to remember, Natalie said. I know I'm forgetting something. I can feel it. But what? Naomi asked. You went over it a dozen times. If there was anything to remember, you'd have remembered it by now. Maybe, but then again, maybe not. She thought back to her face in the mirror. Blood splattered across her cheeks and forehead. A look of shock and horror on her face, as though she'd been caught doing something wrong. A terrible thought occurred to her then, and her heart sank into her stomach. What if she was the killer? What if she'd had some kind of jealousy-induced psychotic break and she'd killed Lindsay? Her stomach turned violently and she felt like she was going to be sick. That thought weighed heavily on her mind, making her stomach royal with sickness. She glanced at the clock on the nightstand and pursed her lips in thought. She'd been planning to skip practice today, but now she thought that it would be better if she went. She needed to get her mind off what had happened. Lying here in this dark little apartment feeling sorry for herself would drive her crazy. After a hot shower, she dressed in a pair of jeans and a pink top. Outside, the street was busy, the tapestry of city sounds rising up around her like a fetid cloud of dust from an ancient mattress. The sky was overcast and trash blew across the wide street. The killer was still out there. Well, that thought flashed unbidden across her mind and her stomach clenched. Who could it have been? Anyone could have slipped in, killed Lindsay, and then slipped out again. Or could they? Getting into the building wasn't hard, but moving through it undetected was. Unless you were part of the show, you'd stick out like a sore thumb. All the more reason that she, Natalie, may have done it. Natalie swallowed. No, no, it was Lindsay's boyfriend, she decided. Or some guy who was obsessed with her. A real creep who stole her garbage and sniffed clumps of her hair from the shower drain. Uh, it wasn't a random thing, in other words. It was targeted, and it was over. Well, they saw no reason to cancel the play, so why should she see any reason to worry? Well, the show must go on. Twenty minutes later, dressed in her leotard, leg warmers, and dance shoes, Natalie stood on stage with the other girls. The atmosphere was heavy and somber, and no one spoke very much. Ms. Mellows walked back and forth like a general before her troops, her face ashen and drawn. 
We're all upset over what happened to Lindsay, she said. It was a terrible tragedy. I know that none of us will ever forget her talent or her smiling face. But this is show business, and the show must go on. Lindsay would want us to continue, so that's what we're going to do. She switched on the radio and Europop drifted from the speakers. Natalie went through the motions like a lapsed Christian paying lip service, her mind far away and her body unable to pick up the rhythm. None of the other girls' hearts seemed to be into it, but Natalie couldn't help noticing that some of them did better than others. The best was a Hispanic girl named Faith. Tall and lean with her black hair and a ponytail, she'd been the second best dancer of the lot. Now that Lindsay was gone, she was the first. Second was Susie, a black girl with braids and an overbite. Natalie watched them from the corner of her eye, but she felt no jealousy, no resentment. After the horrors of the last 24 hours, being the best didn't matter anymore. None of this mattered anymore. Natalie stumbled and Miss Mellows jumped down her throat. Natalie, come on. Is that any way to honor Lindsay's memory? You might as well just go dance on her grave. Oh, sorry, Natalie mumbled. Overhead, a dark shape crept along a narrow catwalk, one gloved hand trailing along the metal railing. The fabric of its coat rustled with a sound like undead whispering, and its breathing was ragged, excited, the heavy panting of a predator closing in on its prey. When it was directly over the cluster of girls twilling and kicking below, it removed a knife from its coat and began to saw at a rope holding a sandbag. The blade gleamed like ice as it severed the rope strand by strand, and the killer's breathing grew heavier and hotter. The final strand snapped, and the bag dropped. The Hispanic girl looked up and gasped, and time seemed to slow to a crawl. The bag landed on her foot and burst, spewing sand across the stage. The girl let out a pained yelp and went down. Natalie whipped her head up toward the catwalk. A stinging ray of light blinded her eyes, but she was sure that she caught a flicker of movement above. Faith lay on the stage holding her foot and crying. Everyone surrounded her and Ms. Mellows fought her way through the crowd, kneeling next to the fallen girl. Oh, Jesus, sage Christ, the woman muttered. Here, let me see. She moved Faith's ankle and the Hispanic hissed in pain. God damn idiots, Ms. Mello shouted at a stagehand who had come to see what had happened. You're trying to kill someone. Natalie held up her hand to block the light and squinted. If there had been anyone on the catwalk, that was a big if. They were gone now. Ms. Mellows in a stagehand picked Faith up and carried her away. Right, keep practicing, Ms. Mellows called over her shoulder. Well, as soon as she was gone, the girls huddled together, each one of them looking up at the catwalk. I always knew one of those things would fall down, Susie said and shivered. It always happens in cartoons, Melody agreed. Natalie went over to the remains of the bag. She knelt, sand gritty against her knee, and touched the rope. She looked up, her face a tight mask of anxiety. Guys, she said, look at this. The other girls came over and stood around her. What is it? Daria Porter asked. Yeah, Tia Farris added. What am I even looking at? Natalie held up the bag, sand pouring from its ruined innards. She tapped the frayed piece of rope still attached. This was cut. Melody snatched the bag and studied the rope, then passed it to Tia. It doesn't look cut to me, the Asian said. Maybe, Tia said. I mean, it could have been cut. Next to Daria examined it. Nah, it doesn't look cut. Eh, it just snapped. God knows how long it's been up there. Natalie got to her feet crossed her arms defensively over her chest and stared up at the catwalk. I think it was, she said and shivered. What if it was the same person who killed Lindsay? At the mention of Lindsay's name, the other girls fell silent. The killer's still out there, Natalie pressed. What if he isn't finished? What if he's coming after the rest of us next? A tight band of fear closed around her chest and she started to hyperventilate. 
Uh, bullshit, Susie said. It was just an accident. Coincidence. It's not like this sort of thing has never happened before. Tia nervously chewed on her bottom lip. I don't know, guys. Maybe Natalie's right. Oh, no. Natalie's paranoid, Susie said. You think she'd be happy that Lindsay's not around to make her look bad anymore? Well, something deep inside of Natalie snapped. She lunged at Susie with a growl. Melody, Tia, and Daria got in between them. Cut it out, Melody said. There's no reason to fight like this. If Lindsay's killer is still out there, we won't get anywhere fighting. Well, it's probably Natalie, Susie said. Getting rid of the competition. Hey, my next Natalie? Oh, you fucking bitch, Natalie roared. And she tried to get to her, but the others held her back. Susie just crossed her arms and smirked. Both of you, get a grip, Daria said. Pulling away from their grasp, Natalie stalked off. In the locker room, she slammed her fist into one of the lockers and paced back and forth, her teeth bared and her eyes hard with hatred. How dare Susie say that? How freaking dare she? She didn't kill Lindsay. She didn't do anything wrong. She took a series of deep breaths and calmed down. She undressed, padded into the shower on bare feet, and stood under one of the shower heads jutting from the tiled wall. She turned the spray on and turned in a slow circle, letting the water pound on her body and soothe her tension away. She went back to the flash of movement she thought she'd seen on the catwalk, and a memory stirred in the back of her mind, stronger this time. There was something familiar about it all, about darkness. She tilted her head to one side and tried to figure out what that meant. Darkness. Shadows. The black. She was sure that the key to remembering what had happened was there, in the dark. Sighing, she turned around to face the shower head. All of a sudden, she felt like she was being watched. She darted her eyes down to the faucet, and that's when she saw it. An eye peeking at her from a tiny hole drilled in the steel. Her heart rocketed into her throat, and she jumped back with a skull-cracking scream. The eye disappeared. Ms. Mellows ran in. What's happening? Natalie could only point at where the eye had been. Ms. Mellows went over, squatted, and touched it. Oh my God, she said. Half an hour later, Inspector Argento and a team of cops combed the building. The janitor... An old man with wispy hair and roomy eyes sat in a chair in the front office, his hands cuffed behind his back and his head down. The other girls clustered around the door, hoping to get a peek at the killer, but Natalie was too terrified to go near him. Inspector Argento took down her statement, nodding as she recounted her story, and then snapped his notebook closed. Is he the killer? Natalie asked. Oh, we're not sure, but... Uh... A cop poked his head out of the janitor closet. Hey, you uh, might want to come take a look at this. Over the course of an hour, the police found a dozen cameras hidden in the locker rooms and women's restrooms. They also uncovered a stash of videotapes, and as Natalie watched officers carry out armfuls, she shivered at the prospect of being on one of those awful things. The rest of practice was cancelled, and Natalie went home. The terrible burden that had been on her shoulders all day was gone, and her steps were lighter than before. She felt sick and scared, but somehow liberated. There was no doubt that the janitor was the killer. It was too much of a coincidence. Still, she had a nagging doubt in the pit of her stomach. At home, she kicked off her shoes and stretched out on the bed, hands lacing over her chest. She went back over the events of the past two days. She saw herself standing in the doorway to Lindsay's dressing room, everything save for the vanity swallowed up by the darkness. She saw Lindsay's dead, staring eyes, saw her own face, saw blood and terror and death. Her heart started to race, and she shook her head as if to dispel the vision. It was over, she told herself. The janitor was the killer, and he was in jail. If that was true, why did she still feel the cold breath of impending doom? 
She jumped when her phone rang. She shot it a nervous look. Reaching out, she picked it up and looked at the screen. The number was unlisted. Something told her to ignore it, but her thumb swiped across the screen anyway, and her traitorous hand lifted the phone to her ear of its own volition. Hello? she asked. Static. She started to ask again, but a low hissing voice, so quiet that she almost couldn't make it out, issued forth. If you know what's good for you, you'll forget what you saw. Natalie's heart sank. Who is this? She heard herself ask. Keep your mouth closed or you will die. A deep, biting chill spread through Natalie and she started to shake. Her little heart pounded against her ribs and tears formed like liquid diamonds in her wide, terrorized eyes. She dropped the phone as though it were venomous and wrapped her arms around her chest. When the shaking and hyperventilating had subsided, she did the only thing she could think of in a moment of trouble. She called her sister. On the other side of the country, Naomi answered sleepily. Yeah? She asked. Naomi? Natalie burst in a whisper. He just called me. Who? Naomi asked, sounding more awake now. Natalie shuddered. The killer. If she related the call to Naomi, and when she was done, she swallowed with a click. What should I do? She asked. For a thoughtful moment, Naomi was quiet. Well, it sounds like he wants to scare you, she finally said. He thinks you saw him. Yeah, but I didn't, Natalie replied. I know, but he doesn't. Look, if he was after you, he wouldn't have bothered calling. He would have just done it. That tells me that he just wants you to be quiet. Natalie regulated her breathing, lest it got out of control again. What should I do? Well, don't say anything to anyone, Naomi advised. Don't give him a reason. He doesn't need a reason, Natalie exploded. He's nuts. Well, even psychos have their logic, Naomi said calmly. Look, I'm going to try and get some time off so I can come out there. In the meantime, don't say anything about the call. Don't tell the cops... Don't tell anyone. If you think she'll be quiet about what you saw, I'll probably leave you alone. Then they hung up, and Natalie hugged herself again. She suspiciously eyed the phone. It didn't ring, and she hoped it never would again. Much later, Susie Atkins lay prone on her bed and paged through a fashion magazine, her legs bent and kicking behind her. Her phone had been blowing up all day with people wanting to know what had happened at practice, and it was really starting to get on her nerves, so she left it downstairs. Downstairs, an elongated shadow slid across the kitchen window. A figure dressed in black, its face hidden beneath the brim of its fedora, appeared at the segmented glass on the back door. It pulled out a knife, wedged the tip into the crack between the door and the jam, and began to pry. After a few seconds, the door popped open and the killer entered, black boots clomping on the linoleum floor like the approaching hooves of some malignant creature. At the bottom of the stairs, the killer trailed one black leather glove along the banister. The cat was curled up on one of the treads, fast asleep. The killer didn't see it and stepped on its tail. It came awake with a loud, violent cry. The killer paused. In her room, Susie looked toward the half-open door. Fatty, she called out. What's wrong, boy? Of course, the cat did not respond. Closing her magazine, Susie got up and walked to the door. A floorboard creaked furtively, and she came to a stop, her heart bouncing. That sounded like a footstep. Hey, who's out there? she asked. No answer. She walked to the door and froze when a shadow appeared on the wall. What happened next occurred in a dark blur. The door exploded open, and a form dressed all in black rushed in, a knife raised above its head. It wore a long coat, a hat, and a featureless black face covering. Susie screamed and fell back as the killer swung the blade. 
It cut through thin air with an ominous whooshing sound. Susie fell backwards onto the bed and the killer scrambled on top of her, the knife raised. Susie threw herself to one side and the blade plunged harmlessly into the mattress. Crying out, she shoved the killer off, got to her feet and ran out of the room. The killer ripped the knife out of the bed and gave chase. Wailing, Susie ran down the stairs, the front door ahead, salvation. She got there just as the killer caught up with her. The knife came down and grazed her arm, ripping her flesh and sending stinging red agony into her brain. She screamed and ducked away, running into the living room. The killer leapt over the couch in a single bound, landing on the cushions, and then flew at her, tackling her from behind and knocking her down. She screeched as the killer grabbed her by the hair and bashed her face against the floor. Once, twice, three times. The killer rolled her onto her back, mounted her and grabbed her throat in both hands. Susie's air supply was cut off and her eyes bulged from their sockets. She tore and clawed at the backs of the killer's black leather gloves, her body thrashing. But the killer squeezed tighter, thumbs pressing into her trachea. Slowly, the fight ran out of her, and Susie's eyes rolled back in her head. For a long time afterwards, the killer squeezed, and when it was clear that the girl was dead, the killer stood, grabbed her by the feet, and dragged her into the kitchen. Shoving the knife into one of the coat's big pockets, the killer went back upstairs and cleaned up any signs of a struggle. Back downstairs, the killer opened the kitchen door and dragged Susie out into the night slamming the door with grim finality. Part 3 When Natalie arrived for practice that afternoon, she found the parking lot filled with police cars. As soon as she saw them, her heart began to pound and the sick feeling that had been present in her stomach ever since Lindsay Fergan was killed intensified. Her first instinct was to turn around and run home, to hide away from the nightmare her life had become but instead she went in through the rear door. The backstage area buzzed with activity, and before she could even get to the locker room, Tia grabbed her by the arm. Hey, did you hear? What? Natalie asked, chest clutching. Susie's missing, Tia said. Her boyfriend. Natalie gulped. Inspector Argento, clad in a grey suit, walked over. Uh, Natalie, he said. It's good to see you. What happened to Susie? She asked, without preamble. The detective sighed. Oh, we don't know, he admitted. It's likely she went off on her own. And these things happen. Well, maybe they did, but Natalie was dreadfully certain that Susie's disappearance was linked to Lindsay's murder. I'd um, like to talk to you if you have a moment. Taking her by the arm, Inspector Argento led her into a conference room where a host of TV monitors were set up on a table. We've been going over the footage from the janitor's cameras, he explained. I'd like you to look at one. Natalie sat in an overstuffed leather swivel chair and Inspector Argento sat beside her. He leaned over, rewound a tape and pressed play. The screen was divided in four. Top right was the rear entrance Natalie herself had just used. Top left was the daughter Lindsay's dressing room, seen from the hall. The bottom right was the locker room, and the bottom left was the hallway. Inspector Argento pointed to the top right. Watch this. For a second, nothing happened. Then a figure dressed in black darted from a bush to the door. Natalie's heart skipped a beat, and her fingernails dug into the padded arms of the chair. She noticed the timestamp. 5.10 p.m. Yeah, but that door's locked after five, she said. I know, Inspector Argento replied. The killer produced a key from his coat pocket, unlocked the door and slipped in. Natalie blinked. There's only one person who has a key to that door, Inspector Argento said. The janitor. On screen, the killer pressed his back against the wall and crept down the corridor, pausing here and there as if at a sudden noise. Finally, he disappeared into a dark alcove. Inspector Argento fast-forwarded the tape. Natalie saw herself and Melody in the locker room. The killer emerged from hiding, opened Lindsay's door and went in. Again, Inspector Argento hit the fast-forward button. 
Natalie saw herself open Lindsay's door and a moment later collapse. It was Mellows and a couple of stagehands run over to help, and that's when Inspector Argento hit stop. I just uh, saw this video for the first time a few moments ago. Do you notice anything? Natalie wrapped her brain, and then it hit her. The, the, the killer it didn't come out, she said. Inspector Argento nodded. The killer never left the room. And that means... A few minutes later, Inspector Argento and a team of police officers searched the dressing room, looking for a way the killer could have gotten out. Natalie stood by the door with her arms crossed, not wanting to cross the threshold. She averted her eyes from the mirror and shivered. Inspector, one of the officers called. Just behind the shower stall was a vent guard, roughly three feet wide and three feet across. Inspector Argento traced it with his fingers, then removed it with the help of a cop. He took one of the officer's flashlights and climbed in. Inside, the shaft was coated with dust. Argento shone the beam of his flashlight around, looking for prints, but the killer had wiped the floor of the shaft clean. I'm going in. I'm going ahead, he said over his shoulder. On his hands and knees, he crawled along the vent for 50 feet before coming to a T-shaped intersection. On the left, he saw nothing, but on the right, he could just make out a shaft of light. He crawled in that direction, and the light got brighter. The vent ended at another grate. Argento shone his light through the slats and frowned. Beyond was a wide space that could hardly be called a room. Sunlight cascaded in from a vent to the outside, and dust motes danced in the air. Pictures were tacked to the walls, and a sort of altar had been erected in the middle of the floor. Setting the flashlight down, Inspector Argento pushed the grate open. The drop to the floor was only a few feet, and after turning around like a car on a narrow street, he landed with a stumble. He grabbed the flashlight from the vent and pointed it at the wall. There were prints in the dust, recent ones. The killer had definitely passed through here. Argento ordered a full workup of the place, and inside of an hour, a team of CSI techs were dusting for prints and searching for other clues. How are you feeling? he asked Natalie, who stood against the wall hugging herself as though she were cold. I'm fine, she said. I'm just... <laughs> she trailed off, not knowing what to say. Yeah, I know the feeling, Argento said kindly. This sort of thing doesn't happen to you every day being in the middle of a murder investigation and all. Thank God for that, Natalie said. I don't think I could handle 364 more of these. They shared a laugh, the stiff, uncomfortable kind, that passes only between those who don't know one another well, but find themselves thrust together by fate anyway. Hey, uh, you want to grab a coffee? Argento finally asked. I want to talk. Yeah, that's fine, Natalie said. Not because she necessarily wanted to, but because she felt she had to. Fifteen minutes later, they were sitting across from one another at a coffee shop down the street from the theatre. The place was tiny but empty, and the coffee was hot. Have you uh, remembered anything about that day? Argento asked, taking a sip of his coffee. Natalie shook her head and crossed her arms defensively over her chest. No, I know I'm forgetting something... Or... Or what? Argento asked. She thought for a long time, straining to recall what she'd seen on the day Lindsay was murdered. Visions swirled through her mind, but they blew away as quickly as they came, like little puffs of smoke on the wind. I don't know, she finally said, but there's something that just... Something I'm missing. I must have seen something important, or the killer wouldn't have... Realizing she'd said too much, Natalie cut herself off. If she'd hoped that Argento wouldn't notice her blunder, she was sadly mistaken. His eyes narrowed and he leaned over the table, putting her in mind of a bloodhound who'd just picked up a scent. Well, the killer wouldn't have what? All of the stress and fear Natalie had been feeling over the past few days surged out of her, and tears flooded her eyes. <sighs> You called me, she said, her voice cracking. She told Argento about the call, and when she was finished, he snapped. Why didn't you tell me? 
I was afraid, Natalie said. He might come after me if he knows I told. Well, he's already coming after you, Argento said and sat back in his chair. He must think you saw him. Sighing, Natalie insisted. I didn't. No, I didn't see him. I would remember that. You sure? Argento asked. That gave Natalie pause. Yes, she said, finally. But she wasn't sure. Argento ordered 24-hour police protection for Natalie just in case the killer came for her. He also put an electric tap on her cell phone in the hopes that she'd get a call back. That night, Natalie sat by her bedroom window and looked out at the street, where an unmarked car sat parked at the curb. Two detectives were inside, and even with them out there, she didn't feel safe. She rubbed her arms and shivered at the chill only she could feel. And when a knock came at the door, she jumped. For a long moment, she stared at the open bedroom door, every light blazing beyond. She held her breath and listened, hoping it wouldn't come again but she'd just imagined it. When it was repeated, her stomach sank and cold terror crept over the back of her neck. He was here. Natalie didn't realize she was on her feet until she was poking her head out of the bedroom door. The knock came again, and she drifted to the door like a woman in a nightmare. Her heart thundered in her chest, and trembles raced through her lithe body. She reached the door and peered through the fisheye lens. In the hall, Inspector Argento held a pizza box. Natalie relaxed and opened the door. I was joking about the pizza, she said with a grin that she couldn't suppress. Earlier, Argento had called and asked if she needed anything. Yeah, she'd replied. Pizza would be nice. The detective darted his eyes from her to the box and back again. Oh, he said. Well, I'll just eat it then. He started to walk away, but she stopped him. He flashed a smile that let her know he was kidding and came in. They sat at the little dining room table next to the front window, the pizza box open between them. They didn't bother with plates. Argento offered to grab them a couple, but Natalie declined. They didn't need plates, and she really didn't need a skin full of dishes to wash, even if the sink were only full of two. Argento looked around the apartment as he ate his brow furrowing critically. He was kind of cute, Natalie thought, and shot herself with the levity of that thought. I guess this is the part where you tell me what a nice place I have, Natalie said, breaking the awkward silence they'd fallen into. Uh, no, he said. It's pretty mediocre, actually, he replied. Natalie was shocked into a laugh. Okay, wow, <laughs> mediocre. Ah, uh, no offense, the detective said with a trace of a smile. Uh, I've been inside a thousand apartments in this city. They all look the same. Some are nice, some are shit. Others are... And he shrugged. Mediocre? Natalie supplied. Yeah, that. And they lapsed into the uncomfortable silence of strangers once again. How long have you been a cop? Natalie asked, to make conversation. Ten years now, Argento replied. Natalie tilted her head quizzically to one side and regarded him with a critical expression. She hadn't given any thought to his age, but now that she looked at him, really looked, he struck her as too young to have been a cop for so long. His features were rugged and manly, but there was a certain softness around the edges that suggested he was still in his twenties. When did you start? she asked. When I was twenty, Argento replied. So, you're thirty? Argento took a bite from his current slice of pizza and nodded. Yeah, he said, around a mouthful of food. Time flies when you're having fun. They were just finishing up when Natalie's phone rang. Natalie jumped in surprise and Argento's face instantly changed, transforming from open and restful to hard and alert. She looked at him with wide eyes, her heart beginning to pound, and he looked back. Both of them were thinking the same thing. It might be the killer. Get it, Argento said lowly, as if the killer were nearby listening. Natalie shook her head. Look, it might be him. I know, Natalie replied. Why do you think I don't want to answer it? He shot her a stern, almost paternal look, 
and Natalie sighed. If they were going to catch the killer, and God knows she wanted that more than she wanted almost anything, they would need clues, a lead, something. If it was him, they could trace the caller and find out where he was. Even so, the thought of talking to him, of hearing his mad, rasping voice, sent shivers down Natalie's spine. Finally, she forced herself up from the table and went over to the couch, where her phone lay in wait, the screen lit up. She gulped, picked it up with trembling fingers, and read the caller ID. At once, the tension rushed out of her, and she smiled. Argento noticed the change, and he too relaxed. Hey, she said. How are you? Naomi asked without preamble, worry in her voice. Oh, I'm fine, Natalie said. She came back to the table and sat down. I'm with a cop right now. Who protect me? She shot a smug little smile at Argento. Oh, that's what our tax dollars pay him for. On the other line, Naomi rolled her eyes. Natalie couldn't see it, but she knew she'd done it regardless. Well, I'm glad you're in a good mood. Meanwhile, I'm going crazy out here. I put in for a couple of days off, and I'm coming out there whether you like it or not. <sighs> no, you don't have to. Natalie said. Honestly, however, having the comforting and steadying presence of her sister would be nice. She wouldn't feel so alone and afraid. Yes, I do, Naomi said. Hey, where's this cop? I want to talk to him. Naomi's almost motherly concern made Natalie laugh. She put Naomi on speakerphone, and they had a three-way conversation with Argento, Naomi pumping him for answers on every aspect of the case. He's only picking on Natalie because she saw him. Naomi said, or oh, thinks he did. Yeah, that's about the size of it, Argento replied. So there's one murder and a missing person, Naomi said. Yep, Argento replied, and there's no evidence that they're linked. Yeah, but that'd be a hell of a coincidence, Naomi pointed out. Argento nodded, conceding her point. Yeah, it would be, but we have to go on what we know for sure. Someone took out Lindsay Ferguson. A jealous boyfriend, maybe, or some girl she had a beef with. Whoever did it thinks Natalie saw them. Now they want to terrorize her into silence. Which is a good sign, Naomi said. If he's bothering to do that, he's not planning on killing her. Right, Argento said, looking at Natalie, who hugged herself tightly. He didn't say so out loud, but there was, of course, a fact that the killer could change his mind and come after Natalie anyway. At the present moment, however, it seemed that he wanted to avoid doing that, which suggested to Argento a personal connection between him and Lindsay. He, or she, had a reason to kill Lindsay, but was hesitant to kill Natalie. That was also part of the reason Argento didn't think the disappearance of Susie Atkins was related. If the killer was pussyfooting around with a witness, why would he go off and kill someone else? It didn't make much sense. Ah, we're doing the best we can, Argento said give you my word, I won't let anything happen to your sister. His and Natalie's eyes met, and she smiled weakly. The fear of the last several days had taken its toll on her physically, but she was still just as beautiful as she'd been when Argento had first met her. Her clear eyes were tired, but still sparkled regardless. Her blonde hair seemed a shade paler, but she shimmered in the light. When he called her earlier and she asked for pizza, he recognized the sarcasm in her voice. Had she been anyone else, he would have laughed, cracked a joke about handing the call over to the NYPD's Grubhub division, and forgotten about it. But not with her. He went out and grabbed that pizza and came over. Why? Oh, because it gave him a chance to be with her. Yeah, I hope so, Naomi said. This is a bunch of bullshit and I'm worried sick. Natalie laughed. Naomi had said something about her being in a good mood, and for the first time in days, she really was. It seemed strange, blasphemous even, to not be afraid in the midst of this whole crazy mess, but right now, she wasn't afraid. Argento was here, and there were cops downstairs. Argento was probably right. The killer just wanted to scare her. And as for Susie, well, surely she wasn't connected to this. Natalie had to believe that. After saying their goodbyes, Natalie and Naomi hung up. Argento sat back in his chair and looked at the pizza, considering another slice, but ultimately rejecting it. Well, better go, he said. Natalie felt a pinch of fear, but said nothing. 
She didn't want him to go. She felt safe with him around. At the door, he said, I'll check back in tomorrow. Okay, Natalie replied. I'll oh, bring breakfast. She smiled to show that she was joking, at least partly. All right, Argento said. You're on. He left and Natalie locked the door behind him, engaging both the deadbolt and the security chain. She walked around the apartment and checked the windows to make sure they were locked. A little bit of the cold fear she'd felt earlier crept back in, but Argento's calming presence lingered around like a warm hug. She checked the door one more time and pronounced herself secure. There was no way the killer could get in. Unless he was a ghost. Oh, she meant that as a joke, but she felt a little twist in her guts. Not fun, Natalie. Not funny at all. Part 4 That evening after practice, Tia Farris met up with Daria and Melody in the locker room. Hey, I'll uh, catch up with you guys later, she said. I want to take a quick shower. Melody lifted her brow. What, with the killer on the loose? <laughs> That's dumb. Oh, they caught the killer, Tia said. It was the janitor. You sure about that? Daria asked. Oh, yeah, Tia said. She pulled her leotard down, stripping shamelessly in front of her friends. Why else would the cops be here today? They were looking for evidence. Probably told them about something in here. Oh, I don't know, Melanie said. I'm not hanging around. Halfway to the shower, perky butt bare, Tia looked over her shoulder. Well, go on then. Melody and Daria looked at each other, then fled, leaving her alone. God, what wusses. Tia laughed and got into the shower. She turned one of the faucets on and stood beneath the spray, the hot water beating down on her body. Well, she didn't show it, she too was rattled by all that had happened, but she didn't let things get her down. Her dad always said you have to suck it up and power through, and that was exactly what she was going to do. When she was done, she cut the spray, grabbed a towel and wrapped it around her body. She went back to her locker on bare feet. The building was silent, the shadows deep. It was almost to her goal when the overhead lights cut out. Her heart jumped. Hey, I'm still in here, she called, her voice echoing. Nothing happened. Didn't you hear me? She called again. I'm still in here. Apparently no one was going to turn the lights back on. She took a moment to let her eyes adjust to the darkness, and then went to her locker. She opened it and froze when she heard a rustle of fabric off to her right. Her breath caught and she craned her neck. Who's there? She called. No one. It was nothing. Just her mind playing tricks on her. She grabbed her clothes and sat them on the bench. Click, click. Tia's blood ran cold. A shuffling footfall sounded, and she turned around just as a shadow broke from the night and rushed out at her. She saw the gleaming blade of a knife flashing down, and she reacted on instinct, raising her arm. The blade sliced her forearm open, and all at once she was running, a loud scream trailing behind her. The killer ran after her, his coat fluttering around his knees and his heels clicking on the floor. In the hall, Tia went right, her bare feet flying over the cold floor. Ahead, an exit sign glowed like a beacon of hope. She made it to the door and tried to push through, but it shuddered in its frame. It was locked from the other side. Trapped like an animal, she spun around. The killer was calmly walking toward her. In the rusty red light cast by the exit sign, he looked almost like a demon coming from the pit of hell. A black fedora perched on his head in a black void where his face should be. He held out his knife and a sob escaped Tia's throat. She ducked to her right and ran down a set of concrete stairs to the first floor. The lights were out down here, and the hall lined with offices and classrooms where actors learned their craft. Panting and crying, Tia bolted to a set of double doors, but those were locked too. A heavy metal chain threaded through the handholds. She went right, then left, gasping for air and never looking back. Finally, she ran into a classroom and crouched next to a table, fighting to keep from breathing too hard and alerting the killer to her presence. 
When she heard the footsteps, her heart sputtered and she pressed deeper into her corner, willing herself to turn invisible. Holding her breath, she listened. Finally, the killer appeared in the doorway, the knife clutched in one hand. Tia winced and damned her pounding heart. Surely the killer would hear it and come right to her. Instead, the killer made a slow, deliberate circle of the room, looking under desks and beside filing cabinets. At one point, he came so close to Tia that she could reach out and touch his leg if she'd wanted to. At last, he gave up and left the room. Tia blinked unable to believe her good fortune. She waited a long time before getting up and creeping into the hall. She listened closely, heard nothing, and let out a sigh of relief. She then turned around, and the killer slammed his fist into her face, knocking her down. She hit the floor, and he was on top of her, the knife cocking above his head. She screamed and thrashed in vain in an attempt to buck him off. The blade swung down and pierced her chest. Blood rushed into her lungs and her screams took on an agonized quality. The killer stabbed her again and again, raining blows down on her. Finally, he stuck the blade into her heart and it stopped mid-pump. The last thing she thought was this. Melody and Dario were right. This was dumb. When she was dead, the killer went into a nearby janitor closet and came back with a heap of washcloths. He mopped up the blood and fetched a large burlap bag from the stage department. He went back downstairs, crammed Tia's body in, and dragged it up the stairs. Tia's head clunked on each tread, and her hand trailed limply behind them. Outside in the cool night air, the killer pulled a hacksaw from a bush and went to work. By the end of the night, Tia would wind up in the swamp, next to her friend Susie. Now, it was almost finished. It was almost play night. The night of the big play, Natalie Harper stood in the locker room with Melody, Daria, and the other girls, worry gnawing at her chest. It had been several days since Tia went missing, and Natalie had been on pins and needles ever since. That nothing else had happened in the meantime only served to heighten her sense of dread. The air seemed to crackle with dark anticipation and suspense built up within her like a pressure cooker. One girl going missing might have been a coincidence, but not two. Argento was convinced that the killer was still active and that both girls had been murdered. Each evening he came by the apartment after his shift and spent an hour or two with her, keeping her up to date on the investigation and trying to cheer her up. It had worked to an extent. After the first few days, Natalie's nerves calmed. Naomi would be there in a couple of days and everything would be okay. Her sister would make sure of it. The janitor confessed to setting up the cameras, but vehemently denied killing Lindsay. He'd been in jail ever since and had been ruled out as a suspect, since there's no way he could have killed Tia if she were dead. That afternoon, Natalie and Inspector Argento had lunch together. You're spoiling me, Natalie joked. Dinner, breakfast, now lunch? Either that or you're fattening me up. Argento grinned. <laughs> Maybe. Well, you dancers are too thin anyway. He noticed the look of hurt in her eyes and recovered. Ah, uh, not you. Look, you, <laughs> you look great. He stumbled over his words like a nervous boy. You guys just, uh, you know, you go through a lot to do what you do. Well, he wasn't wrong about that. Natalie practiced hard and virtually starved herself at times, but that's just what you had to do in order to get ahead. Maybe it wasn't right, or maybe it wasn't fair, but that's just the way it was, and you got a lot further in life playing the game by its rules than you did by whining about those rules. Yeah, it's all worth it in the end, she said. Their conversation, as always, turned back to the murders. Of course it did. This wasn't a social call, even if Natalie sort of wished it was. He asked her to go over Lindsay's murder again, and she did. He listened intently, his head cocked to one side, as if to filter the information through his brain. Well, there was one detail that wouldn't come. It stuck fast to the anterior wall of Natalie's mind, like a bit of food stuck in her teeth. 
She closed her eyes and recalled everything. My face, she said. It was funny. Funny how? Inspector Argento asked. She crinkled her brow in contemplation. She visualized the mirror and her own blood-splattered reflection. I don't know, like... It was floating in the darkness. Inspector Argento hummed. Hmm, floating? Tentatively, Natalie nodded. I think that's it, but well, I feel there's more to it. More than I'm not remembering. Argento paid the check and walked her to practice. Look, I want to ask you something, but I know what you're going to say. Natalie looked at him. She might have thought that he was asking her out. Yes, she would say in an instant. What? It was quiet for a moment. The city sounds swirling around them. Honking, jackhammering, the low murmur of people talking to each other on their cell phones. Um, drop out of the play, he said. It's too dangerous. No, Natalie replied. And that was that. No amount of convincing could change her mind. You don't understand, she told him as they approached the theater. My entire future is counting on this play. I can't back out, killer or no killer. Argento sighed. <sighs> I knew you were going to say that. Well, then why did you ask? She teased. He shrugged one shoulder. Ah, figured it was worth a shot. Now, 15 minutes before the show was to begin, Natalie took her things from her locker and started for her dressing room. But Daria stopped her. Hey, um, do you mind if I take the big dressing room? Daria asked. I want to shower in there. Well, Natalie's dressing room had a shower, but Daria's did not. Normally, Natalie would have told Daria to buzz off. That dressing room was nicer and better. Therefore, it was hers. Tonight, it didn't matter. Who cared? When death passes close to you, trivial things cease to matter as much. <sighs> sure. Natalie said. Thanks, Daria replied with a wan smile. I'm just, um... She shrugged. Nervous? asked Natalie. On edge, Daria corrected. The last time I saw Tia, she was in the shower out here. Well, Natalie understood her point. She felt safer in her dressing room too, even though she shouldn't. I mean, wasn't Lindsay killed in her dressing room? Leaving Daria to it, Natalie made her way to the smaller dressing room down the hall. She opened the door, turned the light on, and looked around. She checked every corner, nook and cranny, and when she was satisfied that the killer wasn't there, she shut and locked the door. She carried her bag over to the vanity and sat down. Time to do her makeup. In the auditorium, the audience had begun to take their seats. In the middle row, a pair of black leather gloves gripped the back of a chair and pushed the killer to his feet. Moving sideways past people who'd already sat, the killer went out into the hall. Dugging into a classroom, he donned his coat and hat. He went to a vent, produced a screwdriver, and unfastened the screws. Setting the vent cover aside, he crawled into the ductwork and slithered silently through, coming to another vent cover. Previously, he'd taken out the bottom two screws so that all he had to do was lift it out of the way. Dropping into the darkened hall near the exit sign, the killer went to the door of the small dressing room, took out a key, and inserted it into the lock. Natalie wrapped her hair in a towel to help it keep its form and applied eyeliner to her eyes. She didn't see the door opening in the mirror, didn't realize the killer was creeping toward her, bent slightly at the waist, knife stuck out before him. At the last possible second, she caught a glint in the mirror and spun around with a gasp. The killer raised the knife and then froze. For a second, Natalie stared up at the countenance of the killer in shock. Her brain couldn't compute what she was seeing. Has she gone mad? Then, all at once, she remembered. Her face had seemed to float on a cloud of darkness in the mirror because it wasn't her face at all. And the killer wasn't a he. Naomi? She asked. 
The knife clattered from Naomi's hand, the look of horror on her face almost identical to the look of horror on Natalie's. The little grease monkey wore a black trench coat and a black hat like something from an old noir movie. Her face, you could say, floated on a cloud of darkness. Natalie, Naomi said with a quiver. She fell to her knees and took Natalie's hands, making the beauty queen jump. I didn't know it was you. I, I didn't know. What are you doing? Natalie asked breathlessly. A crazed smile skipped across Naomi's lips and her eyes shone with madness. Well, I'm helping you, Natalie. I'm helping you be the best dancer. Natalie's mouth opened and closed, but no sound came out. I did this for you, Natalie, Naomi said madly. Her eyes were wide, frenzied, and the corners of her mouth turned up in a smile that somehow managed to be both sinister and bemused. I did this for you. No, Natalie whispered. The terrible truth was beginning to settle in. All the times that she complained to Naomi about Lindsay and the others being so much better than her came rushing back, and the revelation that Naomi had done all of this for her, crushed her. No, no. Naomi ran her hands over Natalie's shoulders, up the sides of her neck to her cheeks, the leather cool and slimy on her skin. Now you'll be the best. You'll be the best and everyone will love you. Breaking down, Natalie began to cry. Naomi's face darkened. You aren't happy. You aren't happy that I did this? Her hands crept to Natalie's throat, and suddenly she was squeezing with all her might. Natalie's air supply cut roughly off, and her eyes bugged out. Her back arched spasmodically, and she tore at the backs of Naomi's gloves. The killer's grip was like iron, and nothing would stop her. Natalie choked, kicked, and scratched at Naomi's face, but the little madwoman's mask of stony hatred remained unchanged. Just before Natalie passed out, Inspector Argento and two uniformed police officers ran into the room. Naomi unhandled Natalie and spun around to face them. Inspector Argento raised his gun and fired. The first round struck Naomi in the chest, knocking her back a step. Her gloved hands clamped over the wound and a look of shock filled her eyes. The second tore out her throat in a spray of blood and spun her around. She flopped face first against the floor, tried to crawl, and then went limp. Natalie broke down, her sobs so powerful that they racked her body with violent shudders. Argento shoved the gun back into its holster and rushed over. He dropped to his knees and took her in his strong arms. Shh, he said. It's over. You're all right, it's over. Across the room... Naomi's body stared sightlessly up at the ceiling, her lips frozen in a crazed smile. It was the face of a madwoman, of a killer, of a little girl who would do anything, anything for her sister. Well, did you see that ending coming? Must confess that I had a little inkling. Not right at the start, but eventually. But yeah, pretty good story. Nicely told. And a bit of a shock at the end. Could it really have been her? Oh my god. Well, okay. Thoughts, feelings, anything else you want to say about that story in the comment section below the video. And as usual, I will do my best to join in the discussion. Okay, that's it for Wednesday. Oh, it's my son's birthday today, so off to celebrate later in the evening. But... Just about had time to tell you a story today. Hope you enjoyed it. Well, till the next time. Well, podcast tomorrow, is it? Yes. And then something special on Friday as well. Till then, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dreams. And bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, 
Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.